In this presentation on inductors, we're going to show circuits which combined inductors and capacitors, so-called LC circuits, and we will also talk about tuners. So the oscilloscope was across the capacitor, and so here is the behavior. So we start with the switch flipped down, and then we switch it up, and then we see our RC circuit behavior, um, and then we flip the switch down and we see the LC behavior and what looks like now just the sort of solid black filled in region that we have to look at more carefully. So if we change the oscilloscope's time base, we can stretch out what previously looked like this solid black region and we can see that it is this oscillatory behavior and this is typical of an LC circuit. One of the main characteristics of an oscillatory form is the period, the time to go from one maximum to the next maximum or one minimum to the next minimum. And so we can use the two what I call needles of the oscilloscope and put them at consecutive maxima and then use the time difference and we can find the period. A property related to the period is the frequency. If the period is the time for one cycle, then the frequency is the reciprocal, the number of cycles per second. So in this case, if we see a reading of 659 milliseconds or 0 0.00659 seconds, then if we take the reciprocal of that, that corresponds to 152 and the units of frequency are known as hertz. So now let us try to understand why the behavior of an LC circuit is periodic. So when we are in the RC portion of the circuit, we charged up the capacitor and now we have flipped the switch. So now we have this charged capacitor and no battery keeping the charges, pushing the charges to keep them on the capacitor. So the capacitor wants to get rid of those charges. Those positive charges on one plate are repel each other. They don't like each other. They would like to get together with the negative charges on the other plate. And to do so, they have to create a current. But we did not previously have a current. The, the, the RC, the behavior, the last behavior of the RC was pretty flat. There was no current. The capacitor was charged. And now to get rid of the charge on the capacitor, we need to start a current. But we know the behavior of inductors. They do not like us to have any rapid changes in the current. So here is my cartoon of the LC circuit. We have the charged capacitor on the right and all the positive charges near each other and don't like to be near each other and see those negative charges on the other side and they say, let's get out of here. But the inductor on the left is saying, slow down, not so fast. So as we've said, the inductor does not prevent there being a current. It just slows down any change in the currents. So the capacitor ultimately gets its way. It wants to discharge. It will uh, produce a current to discharge. And so it's going to establish a current ultimately slowed down by the inductor, but not stopped by the inductor. But now the capacitor has effectively discharged, but to do so, it has produced this current. And now the inductor says, I don't like change. So you keep that current coming. And so then the current has to continue. And now the capacitor begins that was discharged begins to charge. But this time in the sort of the opposite side that the plate that was positive starts to become negative. The, the one that was negative becomes positive. And now the that current will start to diminish because the capacitor doesn't want to be charged again. But it won't happen immediately because the inductor doesn't like change. And so here's the cartoon version. The capacitor has discharged and it says, I'm happy now, but the inductor said, you've started a current and I need that current to keep coming. And eventually we end up with the same situation or maybe the opposite situation. The, the capacitor is charged and there's no current. It's just sort of charged in the, the opposite way. And then the process is gonna start all over again. That capacitor wants to get rid of the charge. 
the inductor at this stage has no current and wants to slow down uh, the introduction of any new current. There's another way of viewing this process. The capacitor stores energy in an electric form and the inductor stores energy in a magnetic form. And so this oscillatory behavior is just this energy, which we're not going to lose. We're just going to pass back and forth into the two forms, electric and then magnetic, and then electric and then magnetic. And so once again, here is our cartoon with the capacitor now charged opposite of the way where we started. And now it wants to discharge. The charge is saying they want to get out of here. The inductor saying not so fast. And we are just at the situation we were before. And so it's just going to slosh back and forth and back and forth. So the LC circuit has a periodic behavior. So we can talk either about a period of the periodic behavior, the time it takes to for a cycle, or we can talk about the frequency, the number of cycles per second, which is measured in hertz. And we will talk about this LC circuit as having a natural frequency, and that will be distinguished from what we call a driving frequency, which we're going to talk about next. So we saw that the LC circuit, the inductor, and the capacitor had a periodic behavior, but now we're going to add another period into the picture. So we're going to have a function or signal generator and a small resistance just to make the circuit uh, realistic and uh, an oscilloscope attached across the uh, capacitor again. And so the function generator has a time dependent voltage it's going to be a sine wave with a frequency and so it has a frequency the function generator has a frequency and the lc circuit has a frequency these frequencies uh, typically will be different frequencies and the function generator is sort of being uh, forced onto the system and it is said to be the the driving frequency and in this case, we see that it is set to 60 hertz. And so here we are showing the oscilloscope reading for the previous circuit, the driven LC circuit. And we see in the beginning some transient behavior, and then it settles down ultimately into a nice uh, oscillatory behavior. And we are using our two needles to measure the period of the form, and we see about 16 milliseconds, which is 0.016 seconds. And then if we find the corresponding frequency, we find that that's 61 hertz. And so this is sort of quite close to the driving frequency. So the driving frequency wins. And then the other interesting thing we're going to note is the amplitude, the size of these sine waves. So what are they at their maximum? They're getting up to about 0.442 of a volt if you look at the the voltages of VA and and for the for the two needles what are the voltages and they are 442 millivolts or 0.442 now we've changed the frequency of the function generator to be about 150 hertz and if you recall this is quite close to the natural frequency of the LC circuit so let's see what happens so here's our oscilloscope reading. We put our needles at the two consecutive maxima. We get a period of 0 0.006. It was 6.7 milliseconds or 0 0.0067 seconds. And that turns out to be about 149 Hertz. And this was pretty much the driving frequency. And again, in this case, the driving frequency and the natural frequency are similar. The big effect you see is in the amplitude. If you look at the amplitudes, they are 7.23, 7.21 volts. Compare that to what we had previously of 0.442 volts. We are having a significantly larger amplitude in this case. And now we're going to go above the natural frequency. So now we are setting our function generator's frequency to 200 hertz, so about 50 hertz higher than the natural frequency that we were at uh, previously. So once again, we look at our oscilloscope reading. We take our two needles at consecutive maxima. We see that the time difference, the period is about five 
milliseconds, that's 0.005 of a second, and then the frequency, which is one on the period, gives us about 200 hertz. Again, we keep getting that the frequency is pretty much the driving frequency, but the interesting part is in the amplitude. These amplitudes right now are about like 1.95 of a volt, so smaller than we would, what we got at the natural frequency. So the biggest amplitude was occurred at the natural frequency. That's the point of this. This phenomenon is known as resonance. So you have a driving frequency and you have a natural frequency. And when the two frequencies coincide, you get a large amplitude, a large effect. We are now ready to sort of understand something about radio. So we are going to take what we call a carrier signal, which is going to be a simple sine wave. And then we are going to put some kind of information on it by modulating. This is usually done at a much lower frequency than the carrier. And now we have this modulated signal and we're going to feed that modulated signal into an antenna. And so we're going to get these large varying currents in our antenna. So we're going to come back to those two laws of physics that a current produces a magnetic field and a changing magnetic field produces an electric field. And we're going to get from that a radio wave. So we put into our antenna a varying current. And so the current produces a magnetic field. And since it's a varying current, it's going to be a varying magnetic field. But a varying magnetic field produces an electric field. And since that, uh, it's, since it's continually varying, this magnetic field is going to produce this continually varying electric field. But another law of physics or a related law of physics is that a varying electric field produces a varying magnetic field and so on. So we have the changing magnetic, leads to a changing electric, to changing electric, change to a magnetic. And so then you just get this wave propagating out from the antenna. And so we are sending out our uh, signal that is lying on our carrier. And so we have transmitted information away from our antenna. So we started with one antenna, a large antenna, which is transmitting our signal. And then that wave that was radiating away from the initial antenna happens upon another antenna. And so we have this changing electric field and changing magnetic field and changing electric field. And so now that changing electric field encounters this antenna and it's going to produce a current in that antenna. And therefore we are detecting that signal. So our, this second antenna is detecting the original signal. But lots of people are sending out radio waves and so we are receiving their signals as well. Um, so how do we sort of get the one uh, signal that we want and distinguish it from all the other signals that we're not interested in? That's the next question. So what we've been describing are electromagnetic waves, these changing magnetic fields that lead to changing electric fields that lead to changing magnetic fields and so on. And so we put some signal onto our antenna. It leaves an electromagnetic wave. That electromagnetic wave can be detected by some second antenna but we want to distinguish our signal from all of the other signals. And that's going to come in different signals having different frequencies. Well, fortunately for us, the electromagnetic behavior has an entire spectrum, a great spectrum of frequencies. And in fact, a lot of things that we sort of originally thought of as different phenomena, radio waves and microwaves and X-rays, all turned out to be just different frequencies of the same electric electromagnetic phenomena. So these are all just examples of the same thing with different frequencies. That's what we mean by the electromagnetic spectrum. Remember that we modulated a carrier frequency. We put our signal on top of this carrier frequency. So our signal has a particular frequency. And so we are going to use an LC circuit as what's known as a tuner. So we saw in our LC circuit, it had a natural frequency. And then 
it can be driven, say, by this signal of information we're reading from the antenna. And then if there is a match of the natural frequency of the LC circuit to the signal coming in from the antenna, then we will get a much larger effect due to resonance. And the other effects from any other signals will be small. So this LC circuit will allow us to tune into the signal we want. So we set the LC circuit's natural frequency to match the carrier frequency of the information. We still have one more job here, and that is to filter or demodulate. What do we mean by that? So in order to prepare the signal, we had some information, and then we modulated that information onto a carrier. So then the job of the carrier was to get it uh, through the space and then to have the LC circuit pick it out and distinguish it from all the other information that might be on other carriers of different frequency. So now we have received our wave, we've uh, tuned into our carrier frequency and we've received our signal, but we don't not any longer want the carrier. It's not the information. So we need to separate out the information, the modulation from the carrier. So now we're gonna play a game with three sort of time constants. So the carrier frequency has a typical time, the period, the, the information has some typical time of whatever it is that you have encoded. The information you have encoded will have a time. And then we can have an RC circuit, which will have the, the RC timing constant. And what we're going to do is we're going to stick the RC time constant between the other two times. And so the, the fast carrier signal is going to be smoothed out. The slower information time is going to remain after we sort of pass our signal through this RC filter circuit. We're gonna to look to see how a filter circuit, sort of a diode and an RC circuit can be used to separate a fast frequency and a slow frequency. We are going to uh, fake a, a, a modulated carrier frequency by having two close by frequencies added together. This produces a phenomenon known as beats and it has this behavior of a fast and a slow behavior combined. So we see that we're adding two AC sources and one has a frequency of 100 hertz and the other one of 98 hertz. So these frequencies are close so they are at times in sync and at times out of sync and then get back into sync. And so that in and out of sync is the uh, slow behavior. So here you see that I have disconnected the diode and the RC. And so you are just pretty much seeing that first resistor, seeing the two AC voltages added. And I just want to show you this so-called beats or this, this very fast up and down, that is the carrier. And then the slower, modulation thereof known as the beats, but for us uh, sort of mimicking in information on a carrier. Then when we send that signal onto our filter, and again, we played with our time constants to get the RC time between the slow free between the slow time and the fast time, then we see that we have mostly just the modulation left. And then there's one final step in all of this. We detected some signal and we've done our demodulation and so on. And so it's the signal as it was sent out in sort of all directions from the antenna became small. And so what we detected was a small signal. And then to use that signal, we might want to amplify it. And so a transistor can be used as an amplifying circuit. So typically we have used transistors in their sort of on off fashion. And then there was some transition phase, some place in between the on and off that we didn't want in our large X circuit. But this is just the part of the, the transistor's behavior that you want for amplification. And just listed here are some of the references used to put this talk together.